the previous tenant of my new flat left a survival guide, part 4. Hi, welcome to my channel. Today, we're continuing the unsolved horror series from our slash no sleep, that we started. This is the fourth part of the series. If you haven't watched the first three parts, you must watch them before watching this one. For those of you that have already watched them, sit back, relax, and grab some snacks. Before we start, if you have some scary personal experiences, that you want to share, feel free to email them to me. Let's get started. I was in complete shock. Looking at it. At her. Prudence had a facial expression filled with guilt and now I knew the truth I could see it. The creature was exactly how Ian had described, except with wavy ginger hair and sadness in its beady eyes. This abomination was Lila. This was how Prudence had bought her back, and this was the only way I would ever see Jamie again, a risk I wasn't going to take. After days of disbelief, the reality finally hit me like a ton of bricks. Jamie was dead and he wasn't coming back. Why did you do this? I asked, my voice shaking with horror. Prudence scowled at me, trying to mask her shame. I didn't want this. If you think this was my aim then you're sicker than I am. I just wanted my granddaughter back. When she died a part of me died. My son blamed me, his wife blamed me and although he never said it, I could see in Bernie's eyes that he did too. I'd pushed for her to stay, I wanted to spend more time with her. I got cocky about my ability to cope with the strange occurrences in the flats. I know what you must be thinking. But I swear I didn't know about sleepwalking until it was too late. We had moved into the flat not long after my son left home to move in with his girlfriend. He's the youngest of three and was the last to fly the nest, so we downsized for the two of us. He never knew what we were facing in that flat or the dangers that he sent his little girl into. When it happened it was a few years after the fire and the troubles with the creatures. We'd struck the deal with the things in the lift and the neighbors of the burned flats had become a fixture just like the other quirks. I really thought she would be safe. Prudence paused to gaze longingly at the mutated little girl in the cage, the creature just twitched. In return, it barred its four rows of teeth and made a gentle hiss. But how did you do this? I stopped her with more urgency this time, looking at Rat Lila in disbelief. I had to get answers out of her fast. I didn't want to spend any more time than was absolutely necessary for this shed. The gardener helped me. She answered, her voice trembling. Who the fuck is the gardener? I grew more impatient with every new confusion she threw at me, the last thing I needed was something new and potentially malevolent in the mix. I didn't mention him in my note because he's been gone for over 20 years, he'll be of no concern to you so don't worry. His damage is in the past now. Around the time Lila went missing the council granted planning permission for the tower block next door. But before that was built the land it sits on acted as a communal garden for hours and the neighboring tower block on the other side. It had a regular gardener named Derek who you would often see tending the flowerbeds out front. Derek was one of the first people I met when I moved in. As I said, I had to work it all out myself, and the first time the window cleaner came to the balcony I naturally reached to let him in and offer a cup of tea. As my hand applied pressure to the handle to open the balcony door, there was a knock at the front door. I made a gesture to the cleaner to indicate that I would only be a minute and answered. There was Derek. He stopped me and told me not to let the man in, that I would be making a huge mistake. I thought he sounded crazy, and I told him so, after a while of arguing I got up to reboil the kettle and let the man in, and Derek grabbed my hands and shouted at me to look at the man outside. When I turned to look, there was no man outside, but a monster. He was tall and impossibly thin, flesh and bones but somehow thinner than bones with graying skin stretched over them. He had eyes that seemed to be so deep set they went on forever, like the blackest cave you can imagine. Saliva dripped from his mouth and landed on my balcony floor, some sliding down the glass panel of the door. I opened my mouth to scream, but as I did, Derek let go of my hands and the monster was gone. In its place was that smug, friendly man, begging for a drink while he cleans the windows. It took me a minute to process it, but I know what I'd seen. That was the real window cleaner. I never intentionally opened or tried to open the door for him again. That day Derek didn't stay long. He didn't tell me what the window cleaner is, or why he visits every few days. He didn't explain anything about the weird things that go on. As much as Derek was a part of the strange happenings he was like one that had been carved from light. He said that he'd always be around when I needed him, that it was his job to look after the residents just like the flower beds. Over the years he appeared a few times. He was instrumental in striking a deal with the creatures. When the neighbors died in the fire he created a special display for them in the garden and made sure that nothing planted was poisonous to the cats as soon as they arrived. 
he also stopped an imposter from killing Bernie at our front door. He seemed like such a good thing for the residents, always there to help. Offer some gentle advice or a creative solution. Someone to be trusted. He changed when they granted planning permission for the other block though. He knew his garden would be dug up to lay foundations and his uses redundant. He became grumpy and bitter over time but no one paid enough attention to notice. Especially not when my tragedy struck. When Lila died I was devastated. Derek appeared to me as I sat on a bench in the garden crying. He offered to help me, to use the garden to get her back. I snapped at him. I told him it was his fault and that he should have been there when it happened to stop them. He worked so hard on the agreement with the creatures, he spent a lot of time with them. Lila broke the rule and he had to allow them to do what had been agreed, he said. He couldn't have stopped them. But he wanted to help make things right. I understood why he hadn't intervened. But I couldn't accept it, I lashed out at him. I'm embarrassed to say I actually slapped the poor man along with stamping on his freshly planted flower bed. I was angry and grieving. I quickly burned myself out and collapsed into a blubbering heap on the floor. Derek attempted to comfort me but his mind was on his garden. He said he was sorry for my loss but I shouldn't have attacked the flower bed. That he'd always been nice to me and I should be kinder in return. I snapped and told him that it didn't matter because it was all about to be bulldozed in the next few days anyway. I should have taken more note of the way he twitched as I said that. He snapped. He said that he knew I was angry. But there was no need to take it out on him, if I was that desperate to get Lila back he knew a way. But it was dangerous. I begged. Anything I said. I would do anything. He told me it was simple and that all I had to do was enter the lift and offer the creatures some food whilst repeating the phrase Reverter Mortuis during their frenzied hours. He said that there was no guarantee they wouldn't be crunching on my bones before I even got the first word out but that if I succeeded I would have Lila back. Of course, it was successful. There wasn't a creature inside as I performed the ritual as instructed. I thought nothing happened at first. She didn't appear straight away, but a few days later I found her running around inside my house, she'd taken a chunk out of Damon's ear with her teeth. I tried to kill her at first, but just as I was about to finalize it I saw in her eyes who she was. I tried to look for Derek but by that point, the workman had started. Nothing was left of his garden, and nothing was left of Derek. No one's seen him since. You see, Cat, nothing in that building is totally harmless. You have to be on your guard at all times. I've kept her like this ever since, you may think I'm crazy but I couldn't kill my own granddaughter. I'm not a monster. Prue sighed and ushered me back out of the shed, she locked the door behind us, closing the padlock on her most hideous secret. I was exhausted. It was a lot of information to take in and as a result of the information I'd received, real grief for my boyfriend was finally settling in. Every hope I had was dashed. I know many of you tried to tell me in the comments that he was gone but I wanted you to be wrong so bad. I couldn't bear to look at Prudence Hemmings for another moment. I made my excuses and left, morosely riding the bus back to the tower block I had once been so excited to live in. It was mid-afternoon by the time I got home. The choice between the stairs and lift didn't strike much enthusiasm into me but I opted for the stairs, and after what I'm sure ended up being 11 flights, I made it the 6 flights up the stairs to my flat. I laid on our mattress on the floor and sobbed for Jamie. I sobbed so hard my throat went dry and hurt and my stomach cramped with each gasping breath. I sobbed myself to sleep. My body and mind must have given up fighting the need to rest and shut down. When I woke up it was late, about 10 p.m. I wrote as much of my update as I could for you guys to hit the post and just sat at the dining table with my head in my hands. My whole life had fallen to shit and I knew it. I thought about so many things, questioned why they were happening to me. I searched social media for updates on Georgia but there were none. Jamie wasn't super close with his family but I knew it wasn't long before they'd start to worry. Everything I considered just snowballed in my mind. The loneliness in dealing with this situation was killing me. I decided to do something I usually wouldn't. I went downstairs and I knocked on the door of flat 26. Terry answered. Her perfectly bobbed hair was a little unkempt and out of place, she had huge bags under her eyes and I could smell wine on her breath. Are you okay cat? She looked concerned. I found it ironic that she looked so disheveled I had forgotten it was me who came for help. I'm not. I'm sorry. I know I don't know you. I just. I could barely speak. Don't worry. Prue called me. She told me everything. I'm sorry about your boyfriend, it's a shame I never got to meet him. Terry stared back at me with the same expression a mother would, warm and understanding. Would you like a cup of tea, maybe something stronger? I'd love a coffee please, 
I answered meekly, making way into the living room, her sofa was comfy, it reminded me of being back home at my parents before any of this started. Terry trotted out to the kitchen, stumbling slightly, I could see the kitchen counter from the sofa, and the empty bottle of wine that accounted for her stumbling. As she boiled the kettle there was a huge crash from somewhere inside the flat. I jumped, feeling startled. Terry coughed in a meager attempt to conceal the noise. Excuse me for just a moment please. She muttered apprehensively as she walked out of the living area and into the hallway containing the bedrooms. I heard another crash, giggling, and some inaudible shouting. After a while, things went quiet and Terry came back into the living room. Sorry about that, kids you know. She announced, brushing off the noises. I'd almost forgotten about Eddie and Ellie. It was late already and the resigned expression on Terry's face indicated that this was how all her nights began. I nodded. I couldn't muster up much more of a response. I think she could see that I just needed to sit there. She got up to finish making and then set the cup of tea in front of me with two digestive biscuits. I hadn't eaten properly in days and I really needed the sugar. It turned out me and Terry get along really well. We have similar tastes in movies, music, and food despite the age gap. We spoke for about an hour about random, normal stuff. It was nice to get a break from the madness. I got used to the crashing around from the twins. I even laughed a few times. I'd forgotten what that felt like these past few days. The break didn't last long. The next noise that we heard was louder than the first. It was quickly followed by two small children, running into the living room diving into their mother's arms. I was taken aback for a moment. Eddie and Ellie were dressed in pajamas and were still the cute children that I had met in the hallway, but something was different. Their brown puppy dog eyes had become deep voids, like what I'd imagined when Prue described the window cleaner's true form. And at the ends of their fingers were long sharp claws protruding from where nails should be. I didn't have time to recoil in terror at their new looks, Terry clutched them and asked what was wrong. They wailed and buried the voids where their eyes should be into their mother's shoulders. Despite their terrifying exterior, these were two very scared little kids. It had been a very long day and I thought my nightmare was over but it was only just beginning. Ellie mumbled into Terry's shoulder, in that high-pitched voice kids do when they're scared. Mummy was sorry, we didn't mean to let them in. We were just teasing. Share coming. Hissed Eddie, in the same distressed high-pitched tone. Whose? What have you done? Terry asked color drained from her face. The kids didn't get a chance to reply. Terry's face turned paler than I thought possible. I looked up and standing in the living room doorway were about 10 people, all incredibly average looking. They were almost expressionless, they didn't look angry or pleased to see us. They were dressed in nondescriptive clothes. I imagine trying to describe them to one of those artists that draw pictures for the police and I genuinely don't think even one of them had a distinguishing feature. That's why it took me a while to spot her in the crowd, even though she had been glaring at me the entire time. Natalia when I first saw Natalia all I could picture was Georgia. The way her skin melted off her face, the smell of her hair burning, and the sound that she made. I didn't have time to count but there were more than I originally thought. I figured there must have been the 15 people Prudence talked about, entering the flats that burned before it happened. I already knew that Natalia was one of them. Eddie and Ellie clutched Terry's skirt, trembling with fear. I wanted to help protect them, but I still couldn't help but tremble a little myself every time I caught a glimpse of those hollow voids where their eyes were. Hi Terry, the kid said we could borrow some sugar? She asked menacingly, grinning at the frightened family stood next to me. After a moment or two of intense staring Natalia finally addressed me. She appeared to be the spokesperson for the group. How's your friend doing? It was a shame we had to end our visit. I was enjoying her company. Don't speak about her. She's got nothing to do with you, you sick bitch. I screamed at her, I couldn't bear looking at her face again. You don't scare me with all your freak friends. I'm not going to let you hurt this lady or her kids. Natalia chuckled. I gulped. I may talk about a good game but I am no hero. Mere days ago I was just a young girl excited to move in with her boyfriend and now here I am. My boyfriend's dead, my flat is like living in my horror movie and I'm standing up challenging demonic flame neighbors to defend demonic looking children. But when I said she didn't scare me, I meant it. Something inside me was eradicating any fear of these people, I just wanted to protect the residents. Life does throw curveballs. I know you aren't scared. I saw it in your eyes when you stuck that big knife in my throat. That's why we're here. My brothers and sisters are not freaks. You're the freaks. Thinking that your lives have meaning. We watch you people go about your day-to-day -day lives and your mundane routines and nothing changes. 
your lives are pointless and disposable. That's why we set the fire, all those years ago. She chuckled throughout her words. There was an animation in them like she was a psychotic cartoon character, finally catching its prey after 138 episodes of chasing. Those people weren't disposable. Terry mumbled, barely a decibel higher than a whisper. What was that Terry? Did you have something to say? Natalia went from psychotic cartoon to school bully. She made my skin crawl. I was only a child, but those people were friends of my parents, they were good people, Terry said with slightly more confidence. None of the other people had moved. They just stood there staring. Why would you burn people alive? What can you possibly gain? I interjected, taking a slight step between Natalia and Terry and the kids. I could see she was getting ready to go for them and I couldn't let it happen. We were living with the great leader, Michael. All of us. Living righteously that he had directed us to live she gestured to the people around her. The name Michael appeared to inspire some sort of emotion in the group. Michael's brother Jonathan lived here, on the floor we burned. He let us hang out there sometimes, but he didn't live the righteous way that we did. He didn't like our beliefs, but he took us in when we lost the place we were staying because of the growth of the group. He and Michael rarely saw eye to eye. They argued passionately. Our group never believed in living within the constraints of societal norms and we were up at all hours, we came and went as we pleased, embracing freedoms and listened to music as we did introspective work. Terry shoved the kids further behind her and snapped, infuriated. You were a group of entitled, bratty hippies following some middle-aged, mentally ill twat. Listen to yourself. The stereotypical cultish drivel coming out of your mouth right now. Terry cried. I was shocked at her outburst. Although I couldn't have agreed more. It did sound like cultish drivel. It made me so angry that this was what an entire floor of people died over. As Terry ended her rant the curtains hanging on the window behind her burst into flames. I jumped and felt my heart skip a beat. Don't insult us. I'm sick of hearing simple-minded people call us a cult. Came from the back row. An average-looking man with dark hair and jeans had piped up, smiling and watching the curtains burn. He had done that. They were all capable of what Natalia had done to Georgia at the very least. For the first time since the people had entered Terry's flat my nerves of steel had wavered. I realized that we were only alive because they were allowing it so far. We were in big trouble. Terry swiftly shut up and Natalia continued her story. Michael was the true leader. Not like all the fakes you hear of in the news. The people you're talking about. He was teaching us to build a world of peace and harmony. But he didn't deny that to do that you had to eradicate the non-believers. He taught us to embrace the bad in us. To harness it so that we could do extraordinary things. She smiled wickedly as her hands glowed hot coals as she spoke. It may have sounded like cultish drivel but Michael being a total faker wouldn't explain their powers. Things went wrong when someone went to the police after Michael and Jonathan had a terrible argument one night. When the police arrived Jonathan told us to go. The group had been planning to leave this building anyway. We'd had nothing but interruption and trouble in our time here, this place is weird. But we had nowhere immediate to go. The police already disliked us after overcrowding the last property. We didn't need any more attention. Michael was furious. We brainstormed in a field for hours who could have done it. I suspected the next door neighbor, Mavis. The woman was so nosy, always knocking and asking us to keep the noise down, interrupting our spiritual sessions. Michael couldn't make a certain judgment on the person who had done it. All we thought we were sure of was that they had to be on the same floor. So he instructed us to go back that night and eradicate the whole floor and every non-believer who lived there. As you know, we obliged. This incited sick laughter from the crowd. I waited, forcing myself to let her finish. Buying time. We took pleasure in their screams, in watching every man woman, and child goes up in flames through their front door windows. It was the first time we'd unleashed all that energy and we felt so powerful. But then as we left the burning hallway behind us and entered the stairwell, this building found a way to fuck us over one more time. I couldn't give you a number on the number of times we tried to run down those stairs, leave our glorious victory behind us and return to Michael. It didn't matter how many times we tried. We couldn't make it past that floor, the stairs wouldn't let us. It didn't take long before the fire reached the stairwell we were trapped in, burning us all, along with the non-believers. We died just in time for the fire engine to arrive. We may have been dead but we didn't disappear. We couldn't leave the building, we were stuck just wandering it, in and out of the burned flats and hallways but not allowed anywhere else unless we were asked. It was awful. We didn't try to cause any trouble at first. We waited for Michael to come and find us, instruct us. Two months passed and he hadn't come. 
Instead came confirmation. A newspaper was put through the door of the building. Headline News Tower Block Resident Bernie Hemmings' Information Vital to Imprisonment of Local Cult Leader on Drug Charges I gasped. I couldn't believe I hadn't found that when I was researching Prue. But I suppose local news wasn't so heavily online back then. Natalia saw my shocked expression and grinned wider than before. The old bat didn't tell you that then? She asked although it wasn't a question. That her stupid husband is the whole reason we're here. We started to cause issues then. Did anything within our power fuck the whole building over? But it didn't take them long to work out that we had to be asked to come in. We only stopped when Prue worked out a way we could die a second time, and that we would come back again. She killed two of our group. She was the only person that could stop us. We couldn't do shit with her around. We stopped and reached a stalemate. Then she moved out. We were going to honor that stalemate. Until you stabbed me. Prue's gone. It's fair game in here now. As Natalia got angrier a member of her group started getting agitated, they all soon followed like a hive mind, working as one, the stillness became chaotic, with all of them moving and making noise. I didn't notice at first when one started walking towards Terry and the kids, but I noticed when it got near. It was a teen girl, slender and pretty, but still unsettlingly average. As she got within a meter of the family Ellie suddenly went rigid. The claws that replaced her fingernails grew longer and sharper, with jagged edges from growing so fast. The voids deepened if that was even possible. She opened her mouth to reveal rows of sharp teeth, blood caked where the tooth meets the gum where they had grown too quickly as well. Ellie jumped. She reached out towards the girl and slashed her face with the claws, leaving deep gouges across her eyes. She clung to the girl using her claws as wall pegs keeping herself at eye level. Eddie controlled the crowd. His claws grew and he ran towards them, sending them scattering out of the flat, random bursts of flames erupted everywhere. Lighting up the whole room. Shit had hit the fan. The two demon children were successfully fending off a group of 15 dead superhuman cultists. Natalia ran from them too but kept her eyes locked on mine as she did. As she ran from the flat she spoke to me. This isn't over. She screamed, and I knew that it wasn't. I stayed on Terry's sofa that night, we organized all the burned items in the house and threw things out before we crashed out in the early hours. The kids' claws retracted and they returned to their earlier state. Causing mischief in the hallways. They were too young to understand. I didn't sleep much. Nothing new. When I woke up Terry was still asleep. I didn't want to disturb her so I walked back to my flat, desperate to avoid anything strange on my way. The stairs must have been noticed because they didn't skip on my way up. I hadn't checked the time when I left Terry's but I reached my door at the same time as a familiar face. Postman Ian was stood there, dropping letters on my doorstep. Hey, love. He shouted as he noticed me. I need to talk, can you come inside, just five minutes? Please? I practically begged him at the doorstep. I told him everything that had happened the night before. How Natalia was out for revenge and I was the object of her rage. I begged him to tell me how to kill them, but he claimed he didn't know. He said if kept my doors locked and didn't let them in then I'd be fine. He looked shirty as I mentioned killing them. Didn't even suggest asking Prudence how to do it. Something was telling me there wasn't much point. He seemed so disingenuous. I wanted to trust him. So badly I wanted to trust him. I had been so vulnerable with him over Jamie. But if Prudence Hemmings could forget to mention what Bernie had done, and conveniently never pass on the method to kill these awful people, leaving them around to terrorize her friends and neighbors. Then could she be a liar too? Could I trust Ian? When he provided no answers and no real help something inside me told me that I needed to get him out of my flat. I needed to rethink. Start working things out on my own. I made excuses to Ian and sent him on his rounds. Prudence left me these rules, but she left so much out. How do I know I wasn't always a pawn in some sick game? Her fantasy life as a puppet master, setting me up to fail. She's kept her granddaughter in a cage for years. Maybe she enjoys suffering. I wasn't going to give up easily though. Natalia wasn't going to win. I decided then and there that I needed to attend the committee meeting today and start building an army against Natalia. I didn't need Prue's help or her methods. With enough manpower, I could do it myself. This was war. What do you think about this story? Are you excited about the fifth part of this series? What do you think will happen next? Let us know in the comments down below. If you like the video, subscribe to the channel to see the next part of this series. Hit the notification bell to make sure you never miss an upload.